I showed it to, I think if you read the book, I, I don't think that that will be your initial reaction after the book. So, right. I mean, I, I just think that it's important to point out that monkey is a stereotype. It is a trope associated with black people. And Mm -hmm. I absolutely understand what the intention is of the content of what you're writing about. And that applies to everyone, people of any culture, people of any background Mm -hmm. and race. Is it just a matter of you disagreeing like, hey, that's not what this is? Um, Can you see that that can be interpreted Oh, I, I'm, sure that it, is. I'm sure it could be interpreted that way, but that isn't when you, when you see the whole purpose and when you read the letter about what I'm saying to them about those thoughts, it doesn't have anything to do with that. It, we, I use the monkey because monkeys incessantly chatter and there's actually Buddha and different religions have I talked understand. about the monkey mind. Yeah. I understand. So, and I'm, yeah, like and I'm I said, not, I didn't yeah. think of. I'm glad um, you brought this up because I, no, seriously, I didn't think of that. And like I said, I gave this to many, many people to tell me what they thought. And no one said that. But I do think with what has transpired this past year and things have been brought up, that could very well be. But I felt that this was something that was never addressed to children. I don't think most adults think about. Hey, hey, everybody. Let's start healing. I'm Adrian Murchison, and welcome to episode 75 of the Let's Start Healing podcast. We have more in common than we think, and what we have in common can change the world. This is a really special episode for me because I want to have an important conversation around race. Uh, I want to have uncomfortable conversations. It doesn't all have to be in one day. It doesn't have to be around this episode. I am just saying that I think that it's time that across cultures, across races, we have these important conversations. And I had one with my guest, uh, Denise McCormick, who is promoting her upcoming children's book. And she's also an author in Kate Butler's Inspired Impact book series. That's a book series that uh, I'm a part of. I was in the book, Women Who Rise. I've interviewed other women from uh, the book series on this podcast and I have interviewed Kate Butler on this podcast who is a dynamic woman who resides in Philadelphia and she's doing phenomenal things. I did not realize at the time that I was interviewing Denise that Kate was the publisher of Denise's book upcoming book which is called never mind the monkey mind and and Kate did connect me and Denise. So this is what's up. Denise's book was to go into wide release on December 14th. I talked to her for our podcast on Saturday, which I believe was the 11th. And in preparing for the conversation on Never Mind the Monkey Mind, I came across something. And before I even get to that, let me share about Monkey Mind. A lot of people know that term and then some people don't. Monkey mind is a term that refers to the mindset of people whose thoughts may be scattered. It's hard for them to focus. You know, their thoughts are jumping from one second to the other. Their mind is racing. That can be the concept of the monkey mind. So no problem with the title of the book. I was looking forward to talking to Denise. I was doing my uh, research to prepare for the podcast, and then I saw the cover of the book, and the cover of the book has a uh, black child on the cover, and the child has a monkey on his head. And so the second I saw the cover of the book, the second, I was like, oh, no, 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 no. So... 
This was early Saturday morning, and she and I were to talk about three or four hours later, about three hours later. So I was very um, offended personally by the cover. Some people are, some people are not. Uh, but I personally was offended by the cover because of people wanting to use monkeys as a stereotype or a trope towards black people. So that bothers me. And I didn't know, honestly, if I wanted to go forward with the podcast. I thought about calling her on the phone and talking to her. And I just, I thought about just sending her a note saying, hey, no, I can't do this. And I thought, well, I always have time. I always take time to talk to people before we actually start recording. Sometimes we might talk and I'm recording just so I don't forget to hit the record button, but I always talk to people before we actually get to the official podcast. So as soon as we got on our Zoom call, I told Denise that I wanted to talk to her before we started recording about the cover of the book. I explained that, you know, the cover bothered me, that I was indeed offended. And her reaction was, she wanted me to understand the origin of the cover and that it is not intended to be offensive. And the cover, she said, was actually, she had an illustrator for the book, and the illustrator is the person who came up with the image. Turns out, however, that the image is very, very close to the appearance of a former student of Denise's who her relationship with this student, student teacher relationship 20 years ago inspired her to write this book. This is what she explained to me. So she felt it was simpatico that the illustrator designed this image. And the illustrator is Chloe Helms, who has uh, done other book illustrations. So as Denise and I were talking, I said, well, let's just start recording. And honestly, in my heart and spirit, I didn't know if I was actually going to air the podcast. For me, I just wanted to go forward with the conversation and see what transpired. And uh, you can hear for yourself uh, what happens in the conversation. Uh, she really shared a lot about her background. Uh, I felt that I was very... Uh, gracious and welcoming uh, and respectful uh, of Denise. And we actually didn't get to the cover of the book until about 25 minutes, I would say, into our conversation. That's when we got to the, to the point where we're actually talking about this specific cover. So I'm going to let you hear the conversation. And my overall point is that I want us to be able to look within ourselves and, as I said, be able to have these honest and hard conversations. Something that came up for me, I don't know if it's going to come across for you or not, but something that came up for me during our talk was I wanted to hear Denise have a uh, sincere understanding. She did tell me she understood uh, the things that I was bringing up. She indeed said those words. Uh, but I wanted to really uh, feel that she had a sincere understanding uh, aside from discomfort. Race is hard to talk about. I know it's hard to talk about, but we need to be able to have these exchanges and not have defense mechanisms coming up. Something else that arose around this is in fairness to Denise, I wanted to talk to other people of color who had seen the book cover because she had explained that at least two people uh, who are black had reviewed her book and had seen the book cover. So I wanted to be able to present that in this context. One of the people that I talked to is a motivational speaker and author, and his name is David Worthy, and he is black, and he said that he has absolutely no problem with the book cover at all, that he supports people for who they are, he supports Denise. He said that he didn't think twice when he saw the book cover, he fully supports the book, 
and I was happy to receive his comments. Another uh, person that I talked to is Angela Sadler Williamson, who's an author in the Kate Butler book series. She is also black, and she and Denise um, are, are friends. Denise actually brought Angela into the book series. Actually, her cousin by marriage was Rosa Parks. And so she's written about Rosa Parks. She has a documentary that can be streamed online uh, through PBS about Rosa Parks. Uh, I loved talking with Angela. Angela is also very connected with Kate and is to not, what they decided to do on Monday evening was not publish the book in wide release and to retool the cover. Previously, you could order the book on Amazon. You should be able to still go to Amazon and see an image of the book as well as the other books that Denise is a part of. And Denise has done interviews in addition to mine leading up to December 14th. Uh, she's done a Facebook Live about her books and uh, promoted her upcoming children's book. Uh, she's done a podcast. She's done interviews, print interviews that you can find online. My interview with her was one of many it's just that I brought up the cover of the book, and I don't know why other people didn't take note or were not struck by the cover of the book. Uh, she has a Facebook friend that had a post on her Facebook page, and there were about 100 comments, literally, congratulating Denise on the book. I didn't find one that mentioned the cover. I just find that really something that no one brought up this book cover. So I bring up the book cover, and so now the book cover is being retold. In wanting to do my due diligence as a journalist, uh, this podcast is my baby, but I do have a day job that helps me pay my bills. And in that job, I have to be fair. Uh, my editors call on me to be fair, even when I'm writing about something that bothers me. I have to be fair. I have to talk to all sides. So that's why I wanted to talk to the reviewers of her book who are black, who supported it. I also wanted to talk to Kate Butler, who in her book series, she has a good, good number of black authors. Most of the authors are Caucasian, but she has a very good number of black authors. So I wanted to ask Kate about the book cover, and I wanted to get her comments and her thoughts. And when I talked to Kate, it, it, for me, uh, these are my words. Kate basically told me that I ambushed Denise and that Denise did not understand that she was coming on the podcast to talk about the book. That's news to me. <laughs> That's news to me. I did tell Denise that I wanted to talk about spirituality, that I wanted to incorporate spirituality into our conversation because that's very important to me. We did that somewhat. However, before our conversation, I was thrown mentally and emotionally by the book cover. Even so, as I mentioned, we didn't get to speaking about the actual image until about 25 minutes into the conversation. Again, this is really about Let's have these conversations. Let's not run from these conversations around race. It's the only way that we can heal is if we have these uncomfortable conversations. I've shown the book cover to many people, and I would say two out of ten. One person was kind of on the fence, and that friend is Caucasian, and then another friend is black, and she wasn't offended by it. And uh, she did think that this would be a lesson learned uh, for the author. But everyone else that I showed it to, black and white, were, <laughs> were taken. They were, they were bothered by the cover. I think if I want to be totally honest, I want to really get down and really hone in on, on what I think is that, and this isn't related to Denise. I mean, she could be a part of this, but this is really just in general around race. I feel, and many of my friends who are black, the rubbing conversations about race is white guilt. And 
we don't need you to feel guilty if you are white. We don't need you to feel guilty. There's just, it doesn't serve. Like if you, I remember I had a therapist and I would feel guilty about this or that, the other. And she just said that that was just a worthless emotion. It was just a worthless emotion. And I've come to understand that. And it certainly applies in the context of race. Guilt is a worthless emotion and we can't move forward without real conversations. It's not just about saying I understand and keeping it moving. It's not just about understanding that. It's not just about retooling this cover and keeping it moving. It is about addressing, well, how did this happen? You know, why did this happen? So I'm realizing that I did not share a comment from Angela Sadler and she actually, after I had that phone conversation with Kate, in which Kate did not want to make a comment to me about the book cover, Kate is the publisher, again, uh, she did not want to make a comment to me about the book cover. She told me that was between me and Denise. And again, she, in my words, she told me that I ambushed Denise on this podcast conversation. So this is the comment from Angela, who I had a good conversation with uh, regarding the book cover. She said, in working with Denise over the past few years, I've come to know her passion for wanting to instill self-esteem and a growth mindset in children. An important lesson Denise learned along the way was to never mind the monkey mind, which is the mind chatter we all experience that often keeps us stuck and prevents us from growth in our lives. As Denise develops this story for children, her vision came to life of making the hero in the book a very special student who left a special place in her heart when she was a teacher in the classroom. We do recognize in today's racial climate, the message of the book would not have come through. And as such, we have decided to pull the book and spend time revisiting the content so it is culturally sensitive to all children. We have put together a team of trusted people to ensure this cultural sensitivity is met with the hopes of releasing this book sometime in 2022. Best regards, Angela Sadler Williamson. So I appreciate that message from Angela. And again, those comments come two days after my podcast conversation with Denise. There's so much in here that I'm forgetting to <laughs> include some things. Denise asked me to not publish the podcast. Again, she more or less, uh, in my view, voiced Kate's sentiments. And I think that this conversation is perfectly fine. I think that I have given Denise, as I do all of my guests, a great amount of grace. That's very important to me. This is a very important platform to me. This is about healing. This is about authenticity. This is about uh, moving forward and encouraging us all to, to trust our authentic selves and to share who we are authentically in our relationship with our higher power. For me, that's God. But whoever a person's higher power is, as long as it's in love, I welcome them onto this podcast. I don't have to agree with everything anyone says. I just want to have a fruitful, loving, respectful, graceful conversation. And it can get lively. Not that this conversation did, but the conversation can get lively. You know, that's, that's not a problem. So have I left anything out? <laughs> I don't think so. I hope not. If you want to fast forward to where we get to it, if you want to do that, you can. Uh, just a little more about Denise. I mentioned that she's a retired teacher. She uh, lives in Iowa and that's where she was. Um, that's where she grew up. And She's 67 years old. Well, she's almost 67 years old. She does not look 67. Uh, not that that matters. <laughs> she's almost 67 years old. She brings that up in the podcast. So let's get to it. 
Let's meet her and let's start healing. Welcome, Denise. Thank you. So <laughs> great to be here. Well, thank you for being here. It's nice to see you and to meet you in person. Thank you. I, I really appreciate this time to talk. And so do I. And so you are, uh, how long have you been retired from teaching? About seven years? Yes, about seven years. You're a published author now. And how long have you been doing that? Well, actually, I published my first story in a book in early 2000s. I fell in my classroom and did a really, really bad break of my right wrist. Mm -hmm. So bad that I couldn't use it for seven months. It took seven months of therapy. Well, my occupational therapist asked, knew I was a writer because I was, I told him I was taking our writing project courses and I really love teaching my students how to write the stories of their lives. And he said, well, would you consider being in this occupational therapist book um, and submitting a story? I, and I wanted to thank him so much for getting, because I'm also a pianist. So my story was, doctor, will I be able to play the piano again? Mm -hmm. And so um, anyway, I wrote it and it was the first one in the section on accidents at work. And, but I didn't tell anybody. I didn't tell <laughs> It was like I told my students and I read at the beginning of the year, but I just, I don't know. I guess I didn't know that anyone else would be interested in it. And then years later, after I retired mm -hmm. from teaching, um, I, that year I went into entre my entrepreneurial journey and kind of time to discover Denise because I never really took time to do that. I was always so busy with young children and going back to school and doing this and doing that. And so I, I went on this journey. Well, unfortunately, my mother passed away very suddenly with a heart attack in January of that year. And then my nephew took his life 10 days later. So uh -huh. I entered a time of the dark night of my soul, I call it. What year was and this? That was in 2014. And so by August of that year, I told my husband, I said, I need to do something just for me. I need to heal. And you're talking about healing here. And I knew I needed to go somewhere by myself to learn from a master mentor. And that happened to be Jack Hanfield's Breakthrough to Success in Scottsdale, Arizona. And I went down there with 250 people from around the world. And it started me, Adrienne, on a healing journey that has just been incredible because I've been able to heal and now I'm helping other people with their journeys and their writing. So that's you, kind of how it all started. What did you discover about yourself that needed to be healed? What what was it that you were I had a very yeah I had a very dysfunctional family life. There was some abuse and neglect in my background that I had never discussed. But the biggest healing that I, that I started my real healing journey was when I was 13 years old. And I write about this in both my books, Women Who Impact and Women Who Shine. There was a golfing accident and I was standing right beside my best friend. Uh, we were at hole number four and one of the gals that usually um, golfed with us wasn't with us that day. And she lived in the house right beside the golf course. Well, she came down to talk to us. So all of us ventured over there to talk to her. Well, one of the girls in our party decided to tee off. The ball hooked. It hit Kathy in the head. I was standing right beside her. Wow. I ran up to the, to the golf course to get help for her. Um, she went home. That just disbanded the whole day with, you know, a, a tragic accident. I left the next morning for vacation with my family, returning the following week to make a phone call to a friend to only to find out that Kathy had died the next afternoon taking a nap from a brain aneurysm. So here I was at 13 years old, no one to talk to for answers. I spent the day up in my bedroom with my quote book. I love quotes, I write quotes. 
um, and my prayer book. And it was a really healing day for me because I made a promise to God during that day that I would make positive choices, even though my family didn't do that, that I was going to honor Kathy's life because Kathy had been the Methodist minister's daughter, wanted to be an astronaut. And so I thought, okay, Kathy's not here anymore. She's my angel now. So what can I do? And so I started playing at church. That's the first thing I did. I, I played the, at my church for 45 years. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, set short-term, long-term goals and ended up with the leadership award at my senior year in high school and went, went on to college. The first person in my family that had ever wanted to go to college. So I, I think, I really believe Adrienne, and this is why I wrote my children's book, that what you say to your own mind through quotes and positive affirmations and prayer, that you can heal yourself enough to get through any adversity. Sure. In my book, Women Who Shine, I wrote about six decades and I went through event after event after event that happened to me in those, the, each of those decades that I had to say to my mind what I wanted. And I say in my children's book, what you say to your mind, your mind then says to you, it all starts with your words, which you have the power to choose. And, and once I found that power as a young person, sure, I was able to do all kinds of things that people, nobody ever told me to do them. I just did them because I believed I could. And I so, took that into my classroom. What are some of the, the things, before we get to Women Who Shine, what are some of the things that you um, started to tell yourself that helped you to shift over the years? I, I guess I, I loved quotes and I really love Eleanor, Eleanor Roosevelt was someone that I read all her books because she was a very shy person, not, you know, I was okay in high school, but I wasn't the prettiest girl in high school, but I, I believe that a smile made me beautiful. And so I had a lot of friends and I made a lot of connections and it just served me so well that I find, I guess I just learned that you gain strength, confidence, and courage by every situation where you must stop and look fear in the face. Mm -hmm. You say to yourself, I've lived through this horror before. I can take the next thing that comes along. You must do what you think you cannot do. I can't tell you how many times I've said that to myself in my life. You Just must do what you think you cannot do. Right. And because I... self-confidence is the result of surviving a risk. That's what self-confidence right. is. Right. And, and that's what I taught my students to do. I was and that's reading... What I taught I was reading, I think on your website that there's a question that you ask uh, uh, in your teaching and in your coaching. Does that question vary from person to person? And what are some of the questions that you, or what is the question that you ask? The one question that absolutely changed every, the trajectory of every student's life that I would ask them, and I would have an individual conference with them and ask this, what would you love? What would you love doing? Mm -hmm. And they had never been asked that. And really, when you think about it, when I coach someone, I have to know what they would love to do. Tell me what your dream is. Tell me what, what you're passionate about. Tell me if you could do anything without any barriers, without anyone telling you you couldn't, what would you do? And then that's the trajectory that we went towards. Is there a and common it, switch that uh, happens? I mean, I'm sure people have different responses, but is there some common little nuance uh, when you ask that question? Well, I believe that people don't care what you know till they know how much you care. And when you ask that question, you're showing that you care about them. You're mm -hmm. asking them what they would love. Mm -hmm. And I never got asked that as a child. That mm -hmm. question was never put to me. But at 13, when I had that experience, 
then I found mentors and then I found people that were doing the things I wanted to do. And I borrowed their belief in me till I believed it myself. Mm -hmm. And so when I became a teacher, I thought that's what I've got to do for my kids. I have to believe in them until they believe in themselves. But I also have to know what they would love doing so I can, can help them do that. And as a teacher, that, that is what I did when I did my master's degree. I did it in the multiple intelligences, which is from Howard Gardner's Harvard study. And it's all the eight ways that were intelligent. So I would allow my students to show me in multiple ways what they knew about a subject by, you know, by putting on a play, by becoming a person, dressing up, doing a video, art, music. So you're talking about students in your teaching in elementary school, right? Mm -hmm. And, but also, I was also referring to adults that you, you oh. coach and teach, yeah. right? And so you ask yeah. them the questions. I ask them the question. The question as well. Yeah. yeah. Yes. That, that is the first thing that I want to know. And then I also have them take several personal finding out tests about themselves, like an Enneagram, finding out what their personality is. And then I coach them to what makes them a healthy person in that and what makes them average and what makes them unhealthy. And, and they start to see patterns of how they can be that person because that's who they are. You can't change who you are. Right. That is your essence and your brilliance. So how do you... Um, with all you have to work with, how do you get to your dream? You do it by knowing some things that you can do that will right. allow you to. Right. So right. I, coach, I coach that way. Right. Well, just to get off track for a second, everybody doesn't know what an Enneagram is. And if you could briefly say what that is and what is, what is your number? What are your numbers? What's your primary number for an Enneagram? Okay. An Enneagram, there are, it's, there's, a, there's a circle of different types of personalities of Enneagrams, okay? So when I took my test, you have to answer questions in different categories of, of how you would respond to something in a given a situation, and then it tells you your personality. Well, mine just kind of mirrored each other. It was achiever and helper. Mm -hmm. And it made me understand why it's so hard for me. I love to achieve, but I'm the goal is to help other people. So when I achieve something, I'm not trying to outshine anyone. I'm just trying to shine myself so I can help others. So it really helped me understand myself and to give me permission to come talk to you, to write my stories to do my children's books because I know it's going to help somebody else because I silenced my personal voice for years. Mm -hmm. I, I remember I told you I wrote that story and didn't tell anybody I wrote right, it. That right, was my right. personal story. So I didn't tell anybody. And when I met Kate Butler at Jack Canfield, that's where I met my publisher mm -hmm. and she planted a seed. That's the name of my story. And, um, and that's my keynote also planting seeds. She planted a seed in my mind. I didn't take her up on the first story. I didn't take her up on the next book. It took me three books to have the courage. And I wrote about surviving the 1980s farm crisis as a farm wife, going back into school and saving our fourth generation farm. So and that is in which one? Women who impact? That's in women who impact. Yes. Okay. Yes. And then women who shine. Tell us about that the chapter that you wrote oh, on women who shine women who shine I didn't know that I was going to do another story but after I had been helping I there's the helper in me again I helped eight other women come into this series as an author ambassador for my publisher and so I just sort of felt like oh my gosh, you know, this is such an incredible experience for women to do. So I think I'm going to do another story. And I will talk about mindset in each decade of my life, because 
my business is called Success Mindset Mentorship. Oh, so one, that- one second, one second. You helped, when you said that you helped women, were you, because I was in one of Kate's books, and uh, was it that process where the writer is sort of working out with Kate what they're going to write about and got guidance through that? It's, it's actually, it's actually me coming up. I'll give you an example. Mm-hmm. I heard Dr. Angela Sadler Williamson speak at our college where I taught here in Mount Pleasant, Iowa Wesleyan University, and she was the Bell Bab Mansfield recipient for an award we had there for the Bell Bab Mansfield was the first woman lawyer back in the late 1800s and she went to Iowa Wesleyan College. And so Angela was receiving this award. Angela is Rosa Parks' cousin. And she had done a documentary called My Life with Rosie. Well, I went up to Angela after she had been working with students, told her how much she had inspired me. And I said, you know, I can really see your story in my publisher's next book, Women Who Illuminate, because you're illuminating the next generation with the story of Rosa Parks. And I said, I gave her a signed copy of my book. And then I left her a thank you note the next day after the next set of things she had done that said, you know, contact me. I can, I can put you in contact with the person that can make that happen. And she, sure enough, she did. She did the foreword for Kate's mm-hmm. book. I she saw. was the keynote speaker for, uh, for Dare to Dream, which is mm-hmm. all the collaborative um, authors getting together. And then I had her come to be the speaker for the Iowa Women's Foundation, um, a, a foundation that I was on the marketing committee for, uh, to help women and girls um, become economically self-sustaining in the state of Iowa. Wow. So that there's, the, there's what I'm talking about, this ripple effect here. Mm-hmm. Of, of empowered women empower other women. And I, I really, really believe that um, we have to start as women doing that for each other mm-hmm. because the world needs women right now. They right. need our brilliance. Well, so, so uh, Women Who Shine, your chapter, I think you said offline or maybe when we first started, it sets up your children's book that is uh, about to come out. So uh, what did you write about in Women Who Shine? In Women Who Shine, I went through six decades, starting with the poem. When I was the Iowa Writing Project instructor, I wrote a poem about that experience with Kathy. I had never spoke about that experience in 50 years. And I had to call the woman that hit the golf ball to ask Mm -hmm. if I could put this in the book. She is now an Episcopal minister, and we had never talked about it in 50 years what did she say she said Denise I think it's wonderful that you're doing this I had no idea that this affected you so positively in your life I mean that that would have been nice for her to know did she say that 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 incident had led to her ministry or changed her life yeah yeah. yeah, it changed her life too because, yes. and ironically, the father of the woman that she hit in the head, you know, with the golf ball, it was a minister and he sent her to the Holy Land later in life mm. on a trip. So it's really a very healing and spiritual connection that this whole thing started. So I start with telling about that. And then I talk about the importance of quotes. And I, I, I did a a story. I did a poem and then I did a quote and Kate, let me just set it up how I wanted to do it. Um, and I even, um, share the Michael McCormick song that I wrote, um, that we did, we do every five years at our family reunion that tells about the history of our fourth generation farm. So she let me just, I felt like, I felt like I was reflecting on my whole life yeah Yeah. and and it gave me such peace to go oh my gosh you know all the hard things you go through can really be your your teaching ground for all kinds of things you can do in your life Mm -hmm. to help others 
And mm-hmm. I never knew that until yeah. Kate gave me my chance to have my voice. Didn't you feel like once you had your voice in Women Who Rise that it changed some? Um, not necessarily. I mean, it was a wonderful experience, but I think that I found my voice years before that, but I do understand what you mean. And it it also has me thinking about a journal that, um, I have a journal just dedicated to my late mother that I started Mm -hmm. writing her after she passed. And a year later, I went back and I looked at each month, you know, I I actually read all the entries and I could just see the evolution each month in terms of my healing around that. And so it's similar to what you said. I mean, it it is something to be able to look back at your journey and feel Mm -hmm. empowered at your growth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 And it, it really was talking about teaching students to read because I'm a K-12 reading specialist and that was my area of expertise in my master's degree. And I was able to prove that if you allow students all the different ways that they're intelligent to, to show those things, mm-hmm. that you could improve the reading level of every student in your classroom. Mm-hmm. And so that set up the most incredible, I I think I wrote this story called uh, Nevermind the Monkey Mind based on a student I had that was probably the most satisfying experience. And that's your children's book. That's my children's book. Yes. This student came into my room in third grade and third grade is the last grade where you're still teaching and to learn to read. And because fourth grade, and I taught fourth and fifth, my first year of teaching, that's more, um, you're learning to read, and then you transition to reading to learn. So if you don't learn to read by third grade, you're behind all the rest of the way. So I felt a huge responsibility to help any student that was struggling at that point. I knew I had to change their belief about themselves because they're aware they're not reading like the other students in the classroom if they're struggling and so I had to ask them what they would love to do and then I had to find a way to make that happen for them and they borrowed my belief until they had the belief and then I watched them shine and so that's why I called it planting seeds in the mind to shine because that's what I did now, this is the story that you're telling in the book, in your book, Never mm-hmm. Mind the Monkey Mind. Are there illustrations was, in the book, by the, by the way, yes, inside the book? There are illustrations. And I gave my illustrator total control over how she illustrated it, who she decided my one character was going to be, and everything about it. And ironically, and I have to tell you this part of the story because it was, it was so interesting to me how it developed. When I saw who it was and who she had picked a boy and he had been in my third grade class, in my mind, that's who I patterned the story. That's how I got the initial idea. But all students fit it because we all have negative chatter in our heads. Every single person does. But when I saw it, I had to call her up on Messenger. I said, Chloe, you are not going to believe this. I just found this class composite. Look at the similarity between the boy that inspired me to write this story and the boy you, and she couldn't believe it either. So I think sometimes when you just let things happen and don't Mm -hmm. worry about how they're going to happen, they happen how they're supposed to happen. And that you were telling me offline that this person is an adult now, right? Yes. And you taught him in third grade. He's probably in his twenties, you think? Yeah. Yes. Cause he came back to me in fifth grade with a great big thick chapter book. And he said, Miss McCormick, see what I'm reading now. And I said, Charles, He, he said, you helped me. You were the first person to help me to read. And I go, now, wait a minute, (laughs) you helped yourself to read. I just asked you one question about what you would love to do. And you told me what you would love to do. And then you did the hard work. You showed the perseverance, you believed, and you did it. And he goes, Mm -hmm. 
goes, he just smiled. He goes, yeah, you're, you're right. I did do it. And so, you know, that's the premise. I remember that as one of my most um, special teaching moments, because usually students don't come back to you and tell you things after mm -hmm. they leave your classroom. Right. You just, right. You know, back on the, in the, the picture back here is these are all the, when I saw this picture of a friend of mine, who's an artist, I thought of it as all my students that I don't know what they became as adults, mm -hmm. but I planted all those seeds and like, they're not, they're not definite because I never found out, but they're all out there. They're, <laughs> they were, I planted so that's sort of my little story for my yeah. background. Yeah, I, it's, I mean, I think uh, the older I get, the more I think teaching is just uh, an incredible profession. Oh, really incredible and profession. It, yeah. So offline, we talked about the cover of your book. And mm -hmm. when I saw the cover of the book, it struck me, I have to acknowledge that I was offended by the cover of the book because of the title. And the title is Never Mind the Monkey Mind. And just looking at the words, I mean, I, I think I understand a point that you're making about color because the words are each in a different color. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the actual boy on the cover is a little black boy and he has a monkey on his head. And I did share this with two people. One is an educator, one was black, one was white. They each had the same reaction that I did. And so I would like for you to speak to that. And also I had asked you if you had had an opportunity to share the cover with you know, anyone of color to try to get their take. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned that you hadn't. Actually, actually, I have two people of color that reviewed my book. Um, David Worthy is a author of the Ar You Are the Architect of Your Life. He's a life transformation coach and a key keynote speaker. And he said of my book, never mind the monkey mind was written to assist our children with a growth mindset, clean and simple, but profound in its detailed way of helping a child recognize what thoughts are worthy of their attention. This book has deep implications of mindset development and is an amazing tool for children who are discovering that a growth mindset is a key to lifelong success. Okay. And then Dr. Angela Sadler Williamson is uh, Rosa Parks' cousin. And she said, during a time when children feel like the pressures of life are suffocating their dreams, Denise McCormick uses a cute monkey to inspire, entertain, and empower young girls and boys to feel strong and powerful. So what, there's a letter to the students from me in the book at the end. There's four activities and it tells them about the thoughts, number of thoughts. Do you have any idea, Adrienne, how many thoughts we have a day? Oh, I know it's thousands. Thousands. <laughs> yeah. It can range from 12,000 yes. to 60,000. Do yeah. you know what percentage of those thoughts are negative? Uh, probably, I would say over 80%. You're, you're right on. Yes. Yeah. And 90% are the ones we had yesterday. So it's all about changing our language around the thoughts that are coming into our brain. And never mind the monkey mind means. Never mind that chatter that you're hearing. That's not you. I actually wrote a song at the end of the book. Never mind the monkey mind because that's not really me. Never mind the monkey mind because that's not really me. I am strong and powerful. Yes, I can succeed. So never mind the monkey mind. That's not really me. No, no, no. Yes, I can succeed. Go, go, go. Yes, I can succeed. So it really, I use the monkey mind because there's several books. If you'll look, if you'll do your research online, there are actual um, connotations to the monkey mind. It has nothing to do with race or anything. It has to do with the negative thoughts. Okay. Right. And the content of your book, which I haven't read the book, it comes out on the 14th, right? December 14th. Right. right. So it's not 
uh, that's not in question for me at all. And let me ask you something. Um, the two people that you mentioned who had reviewed your book, did they mm -hmm. see the cover of the book? Oh, yes. I sent them the book. Every person, Dr. Patricia Wolf, she's an expert in application of neuroscience. Jack Canfield reviewed the book. He said, every child needs to learn how to address the negative self-talk of their monkey mind so they can be all they can be and achieve all of their dreams. This delightful book will help you help them to do that. Right. So, so D Angela, I'm sorry, I can't think of her last name. Yes. Uh, and Angela David Sadler. Worthy. Right. Yes. And David Worthy. And I they showed both it saw. to many other people. I showed it to, I think if you read the book, I, I don't think that that will be your initial reaction after the book. So, right. I mean, I, I just think that it's important to point out that monkey is a stereotype. It is a trope associated with black people. And mm -hmm. I absolutely understand what the intention is of the content of what you're writing about. And that applies to everyone, people of any yeah. culture, people of any background mm -hmm. and race. Is it just a matter of yeah. you disagreeing? Like, hey, that's not what this is. Um, can you see that that can be interpreted oh, as I, something I'm sure that it, is? I'm sure it could be interpreted that way. That that isn't when you when you see the whole purpose and when you read the letter about what I'm saying to them about those thoughts, it doesn't have anything to do with that. It, we I use the monkey because monkeys incessantly chatter, and there's actually Buddha and different religions that talk about the monkey mind. Yeah, I understand, so, and I'm yeah, like and I'm I not. Said, I didn't yeah. think of I'm glad um, you brought this up because I no seriously I didn't think of that and like I said I gave this to many many people to tell me what they thought and no one said that but I do think with what has transpired this past year and things have been brought up that could very well be but I felt that this was something that was never addressed to children. I don't think most adults think about the I wouldn't number have, if, of thoughts. If there awareness. was no, if only the words were on a cover of, of the book, or if there was a white child on the cover of the book, I wouldn't have thought anything of it. I mean, mm -hmm. I've, I understand well, what the title of the book is, but when I see a black child on the cover of the book, with the word monkey next to him and a monkey on his head, mm. that is startling to me and offensive to me. Okay. And well, that and certainly was not the intent. Of the I book. know, but this is something that I think is important yeah. to talk about because even though it's yes. not an intention, I think here's where the rub comes in is, does it matter? And it does mm. matter. I mean, does it matter for you that... Mm -hmm someone can look at this and that's what they see. Hmm. Well, of course it does. Of course it does. Um, I hope that they will. Um, it's kind of like any cover you see of a book. I hope they won't judge the book by the cover. I hope they will look into the book. I hope they will do the activities at the end. I hope they will ask those wonderful questions that I put in there to ask any child. Mm -hmm. And I hope they will understand that the, the wonderful story that, you know, this, this, this um, story came to me about mindset um, for, because of this student, I did not talk to my illustrator about any details of the sex of the child, the, the ethnicity, anything. And, and, and it just worked out. So it, well, I, I mean, it, it I raises a question for me too, about the, about your illustrator. I mean, putting a monkey with a black person requires some thought. It requires a second thought, I should say. Yeah. Like if it's, I, I, guess, it, it I guess maybe this will be good good conversations around this because you know as we're both white women so you mean you and your did, illustrator yeah she's an yeah. art teacher mm -hmm. and um you know I, I think 
we just, you know, we, I gave her total creative, um, ability to do it. And I'm, I was always looking for all kinds of books. So I, I made sure I had an equal representation of my Hispanic, my Asian, my black, my white kids of books in my room. So, you know, it didn't, it didn't, it didn't even dawn on me that, you know, that could be an issue. So I'm being no, I, I don't, I don't doubt that. Honestly, I don't doubt that. I think that it's a, a teachable moment um, mm-hmm. because it's a big deal. <laughs> yeah. It's a well, big deal. And it could be a I, big deal for, and I'm not, I don't, I have no clue who the student is and. Well, I but, don't name him. But, so right. But potentially there could be a young black man who this represents and he has no idea that this represents him and that does matter to him Mm. because he could be experiencing bias and racism in you know let's say once a week let's say seven days a week or once a month it's something that he knows as a black person and here he is on the cover of a book with a monkey on his head I'm just Mm. trying to just just kind Mm -hmm. of bring some reality to, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to, well, it's, it's good. It's good that you're, that you're uh, voicing this. And like I said, I presented this to many people and um, they, they loved it. So including my publisher. So, you know, it's, we're always going to have lots of perspectives on things. And I expect that. Um, when you when you write something, you're always leaving yourself open to someone seeing it a different way than you saw it. And so, let me tell you, I'm a it. I'm a writer. I'm a journalist. I have a story online right now. It was in the paper yesterday. I have an email from someone uh, this morning who mm-hmm. <laughs> says I found this obnoxious. Aww. This morning, <laughs> so uh, it you happened. Can please. It, yes, you can't please everybody, but what I want them to see from this book is this boy solved his own problem, asked questions, and succeeded, and that's the goal. The school where you taught was it um, uh, integrated school in terms of oh, you had a balance had of black 15, and white students. We had fifteen different nationalities in our school system. And yeah. the college I taught at, it's the most diverse small college in the United States they have from all over the world. So I really, and I've, I've traveled all over the world, Adrian. Mm-hmm. I've, I took students, people to people, student ambassadors. I took middle schoolers all around the world and they had home stays for five summers. So I really believe that, uh, that travel is fatal to narrow-mindedness, bigotry, and prejudice. I saw yeah. that you wrote that. I understand yeah. that. And, and so trust I will me, probably bring things up just simply because I really believe that once we have conversations, direct conversations, not innuendos, but direct, we can all find out that we have more in common than we have different you know, right. And that's so. exactly what this podcast is about. And I mean, race isn't an easy conversation to have. And, no. and I don't no. doubt your no. intentions or your goodness or any, anything like that. No. Um, but this is a real, this is a yeah. real thing. You and, know, when you, I'll, I'll be, I'll be a hundred percent honest with you. When you said that to me right before we went on, I had not made that connotation at all. Which is because that was, in itself I, is. Yeah, I was strictly dealing with what the monkey mind stands for, which is the negative thoughts. Right. But it's significant that in itself that that hadn't crossed your mind. And I'm not saying that as a a bash or anything. I'm making a point that, you know, that's the state of our country Mm -hmm. and world right now is that, you know, we have people of color and there's also other issues, you know, that could be yeah. about sexuality well, and identity and all that kind of thing. But right yeah. now I'm talking about race. So we have well, people of color who are experiencing things that people who are not of color just have no sensibilities about that. I think it's, 
I'm an, I'm an empath. So it's something I can't comprehend. So yeah. it's, I, yeah, yeah. Well, I, you know, I have, a, I have a, uh, my son-in-law is, was originally from China and my other son-in-law is an Australian. So I don't know, I guess I just am very, um, uh, I don't know what the word is. I'm very open. I don't, I don't see differences. I see. Yeah. A human bond. And, and, and that's why I was a stated awarded teacher. I am sure because I have always been able to transcend the problem and come up with a solution. And that that's what I hope this book will lead to. And because I'm going to do more in the series, the second book will be I'm taking 100% responsibility. And so this cover, I think, plays into everything that you just said. I mean, to me, this cover is an opportunity to be a part of the conversation. Because mindset, you know, the issues that we deal with in this country, in this world is a part of our mindset. Oh, and what, so definitely. this cover, if someone doesn't like yourself, if you don't see anything wrong with the cover, that in itself is an opportunity to have a conversation. I agree. Uh, yeah. When I was reading about you and just the monkey mind, and I was trying to just really look into, well, my own thoughts about how I feel about the cover. And I was reminded of uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe's book, Uncle Tom's Cabin. And what I read about her was that her intention was not for the book to be racist, but that's what it was. Mm -hmm. So not that your book is racist. I'm not trying to say that at all. No, I I understand what you're saying. yeah. Yeah. I know my intention is honorable. So I'm not going to be offended if someone brings that up. I'm going to, I'm going to talk about it. I'm going to say, isn't it sad that that's unfortunately what somebody of color might feel? Isn't that sad? I think that it's a, it's a, like on one hand, that's not your intention at all, the way it could be received in a negative way, but isn't that sad part? might feel sad, but it can, that can also be taken as a disregard for, Oh, I don't disregard it. And so that's an, that's an important point to me. Yeah. I don't disregard it because because I, I remember sending Angela, um, a a video or or me singing a, a song after George Floyd called, we can be kind. And we can remember that deep down inside, we all need the same thing is what the song is saying. And it, I said, I don't know what to say to you. This is the one thing that I wish for the world that we could be kinder and that we could realize that we all need the same thing. We all need to be loved and respected. And that's something I taught in my classroom. I started the classroom out with a golden rule book which in every religion, the golden rule appears. Doesn't yeah. matter what religion around the world. And that's what this book highlights. And we talk about different religions. We talk about different races. We talk about how in our classroom, we will respect every single person. We will learn to listen to each person and respect what they have to say and their point of view. I mean, that's how I taught, Adrian. Mm-hmm. That's, mm-hmm. I did it in college and graduate classes also. Yeah. I understand that there's something in addition to respect. It's an acknowledgement and an understanding of um, each role, you know? Mm -hmm. So like, say for like, say take slavery. In my opinion, Black people and white people were in this together. I mean, Mm -hmm. Black people were enslaved Uh, But there's also the other side of the person who was enslaving the Black person. And how does a person come to even do that? How is that even in a person's makeup to even do that? And so that's important as well. And so it's important to to look at, I think, from the white perspective, not just a matter of 
respecting other people and respecting their culture and respecting the differences, but to also look in the mirror and look at, you know, well, what am I doing? What microaggressions do I have? What am I blind to? You know what I'm saying? There's a lot to it in addition to um, the respect, to respecting it. Yeah. And I understand I'm not, I'm not black. And so I have not experienced the things that I saw some of my students even experience, mm-hmm. but I am, a, I am, I'm an empath too. And I feel other people's feelings. And I guess uh, I really believe that we have the power within ourselves that even when other people are choosing to say those things, think those things, that it's what we say to our own mind. That's the most important thing. Yeah. And we all have to deal with that every single day with our mindset. Oh, that's and I true. have proven in my life that, um, you know, I'm not with everything that's, that's happened, the adversities I've had, I shouldn't be doing this. And it's only because of my mindset. And I that's, agree. that is totally what I am here to do because, you know, at, as a, you know, an, um, I'll be 67, February 1st. And one of the gals that um, did my book was Dr. Patricia Wolf. And I was in a neuroscience class with her in the 1990s. And she probably walked in about my age. And she said, don't retire, redirect. <laughs> and I went, oh, I will say that the rest of my life because I don't have any intention of mm. retiring. I intend to take all my passions, all my experience, all my knowledge and find a way. And I've done this on my, I have a, uh, the educator's edge. It's a web, it's a private Facebook group for educators around their self-care because it wasn't in existence in support in my, in teaching personal development, which I went on a seven year journey with that. And I bring authors on every week. And I'm promoting their books and we're talking about the story behind the book. See, until you know the story behind why I wrote what I wrote and what you see, it's a completely different. So I I do that and I've done it almost a year now. So I just sort of feel like my message is to inspire people to never stop dreaming about what they would love to do. I always wanted to be a writer. I always wanted to do children's books. I always wanted to do songs with them. I made up songs in my classroom to teach every subject. And I thought I would see things other people wrote. I I can do that. (laughs) And then this this all happened and I thought, okay, I'm going to start with positive mindset first. And so that's where this came from. Well, one, I love that redirect. Don't retire, redirect. I love that. Another thing I want to say is the only reason I would thought 60 is because you said six decades. <laughs> I would never think you were 67. So you look yeah, great. Thank you. Um, so I have these healing questions I want to just ask you before we wrap okay. up. Sure. And this podcast for me is very much rooted in God and my spirituality. And I'd like to know, what is your perception of God or your knowing of God? How would you describe oh, I, that? I think I was very blessed to, um, to, to really rely on God at a very young age. You know, when I suffered abuse and neglect in my early, early years, I always believed I was protected by my God and my angels. And I always prayed and I always read quotes and I had a prayer book. And when I had that experience at 13, I have always known that I was supposed to do something special in my lifetime. And I, I tried to do it every decade, but you're limited when you've got children and you've got this and you've got your job. And, but now I feel like, it's wide open Mm -hmm. to do whatever I want to do. So, you know, I'm a a certified Canfield trainer in the success principles. So I want to write books to help children with areas that maybe nobody's talked about. I don't think anyone's ever talked about the negative chatter that we hear in our heads. I don't remember even talking about that in my 26 years as an educator. 
So now that I have that information, I want to write books around it. And then I want to go out to classrooms and then I want to train teachers and then I want to write a curriculum. So the, it's, it's going to go on. And then mm -hmm. I'm also a worldwide woman speak circle leader. And I want to get women in circles where they can start to work on their speaking so they can become more um, self-assured mm -hmm. in their own personal speaking not in their profession speaking that'll that'll carry over sure. but if you can't speak your own truth and feel you're in, it 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 creates a safe environment to do that and once right. you do it in a safe environment you can do it anywhere right right but you right need that so that's another thing i'm doing so yeah is there a time that you most feel the presence of god Every morning, I have this as a free download on my website. I, every morning I do what's called the morning on purpose. Mm -hmm. I get up at 4.30 and I come into, uh, a, used to be a, one of our daughter's bedrooms, but now I've made it into uh, my wonderful little office. I have my keyboard over there and all my books and my reading. And I, I sit and I pray and then it goes to meditation and then I journal whatever I hear in the meditation. Um, I'm going mm -hmm. to be starting a, a writing certification mastermind in January that will um, work, be around mindset first and journaling. And then the level two will be uh, writing a book, writing a story, writing a chapter, lead into that. So that's kind of the direction I'm going because I just really think... Um, that women, um, everybody has a story. Eight, my publisher said 80% of people want to write a book, 5% uh, do it, and about 1% get to best, in, uh, best selling. Mm -hmm. So it is something that people want to do. And I can't tell you the number of people when I tell them I've done a book, they go, oh, I, I'd like to do a book, you know? <laughs> I said, you've got a story. I said, just start writing it down. Just start, start journaling. Right. I said, that's how I started. So yeah. well, what I is think the, God, is, God is definitely my guide on a daily basis. Yes. What do you think is the thing that um, uh, God calls you to do for yourself as well as others in your work? Um, I think he calls me, I'm a singer and a songwriter too. And I think he's calling me to, to continue with that. I've got a YouTube channel. I don't have everything in on it yet, but there'll be music in there too. Um, I have always had, I, I write my own music too. Mm -hmm. And I've always had a burning desire um, to um, express myself through music. And so every book I write will have a song that cements the lesson of the book in the mind of the child, because that's what I did in the classroom. Right. And that's right. why in advertising, they use music because music cements it. So. Right. Well, I so appreciate you. Uh, where can people get in touch with you? Should they go to your website? Uh, what is the best way for people to contact you and well, learn my more website and get your book? Yeah, www.denisemccormick.com. And I am on Facebook. Um, I am I have a, a personal page, a, a business page, and I have this page called The Educator's Edge. Um, and I have a broad form of educator. I mean, anybody that educates anyone in my mind is an educator. Uh, you know, you do that through your podcast, so it's broad. And um, I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on Instagram. Yeah. And my email is just Denise at denisemccormick.com. Well, I really appreciate you being uh, so open and just being here on Let's Start Healing. I've really enjoyed talking to you. Thank you. Thank Denise. you. And I, I appreciate you bringing up all aspects of this because this is one of the things that I think we have to do. We have to talk about our reaction to things and then we just keep understanding where everybody else is at within that context of it and that that's how we'll eventually and I I, I want to see it in my lifetime I want to see it before my five grandchildren 
a grow up that we can resolve this. So we, we have to talk. The conversation continues. <laughs> Thank you so much, Denise. Bye bye now. Thank you for joining us. Remember, you can listen to all of our episodes on traditional podcast platforms. Please let me know what you think of our conversation. Until next time, let's start healing. <laughs>